right, thanks everyone. Uh, thanks, appreciate you joining us today. Uh, my name is Mike Pastor. I'm an account representative for Building Point Pacific, uh, your authorized Trimble distributor in California and Hawaii. Uh, presenters today will be Gustavo Chodo. Uh, he is also with Building Point Pacific. Um, he's a technical solution specialist uh, and, and my counterpart for our estimating and pre-construction solutions. Uh, and we also have Mike Milone. Uh, the Trimble product manager for Model Logics, uh, the, the solution we'll be presenting this afternoon. Um, bef before we kick it off to Mike uh, to run through some slides, uh, please be aware all the attendees are currently muted. Uh, Mike and I will, will be answering questions via the chat window throughout the webinar. Uh, so if you have any questions, please send them there uh, and him and I will do the best to answer them or we can, uh, we can get those uh, posted um, to Gustavo to answer uh, while, he, while he's presenting. Um, in the incurrence, we, we aren't able to answer everybody's questions. Uh, we'll we'll get, in, get back with you uh, with an email after the webinar and, and, and we'll answer your questions that way. Um, so, so with that said, uh, I'll kick it off to Mike Malone with Trimble uh, and, and let him start with uh, going through a few slides and then and, and Gustavo will jump into the software. That's uh, all you, Mike. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for the opportunity to present uh, our solution here today. So I'm going to run through some kind of overview slides. Uh, I won't PowerPoint you to death here. I'll, I'm going to do six or seven kind of introduction slides to the product, um, mainly focused on. Click here. There we go. Mainly focused on uh, the, the problem we set out to solve uh, when we introduced this product in the market. Product being Model Logics. Uh, our mission statement for the product. So, you know, what can we, what can we kind of guarantee you, or what can we promise you that that you'll see from a benefit perspective uh, if you decide to implement the solution? Um, we'll go through generally what the Model Logic solution is. So, kind of a features and benefits um, slide. I'll show you some client feedback from a couple of our our uh, customers. Uh, also, show you some of the other customers we have who's using this product in the market today from a from a GC perspective, um, and we'll go through what you can expect from a return on investment, and then I'm going to pass it over to Gustavo for the uh, for the demo. So let's kind of run through these slides today, and um, feel free, uh, you know, during the call to have uh, enter any questions in the chat, or you can reserve them for the Q and A session at the end. And I'd be happy uh, as the product manager to. Uh, answer any kind of technical questions you have or capability or functionality questions related to the product. So uh, what's the problem statement? You know, what did we set out to solve uh, with this product uh, when it was introduced to the market a few years back? Um, so this is really a, a product that is geared towards estimators and, and uh, basically anybody in pre-construction. Um, and, and what we found was that uh, General contractors are losing out on business because they cannot respond uh, timely uh, or accurately to uh, opportunities where the scope or design is limited. So what we like to refer to as a conceptual or, or budgetary or courtesy estimate uh, that you would give to an owner. There's, there's kind of napkin scope uh, available. There's not really a good mechanism in the market today to um, provide that response uh, neither timely uh, or accurately. So, so this product is really geared to solve that problem. Um, we also see that this product can uh, set a GC apart um, in this competitive marketplace uh, by using the product to really show that, um, you know, when they arrived at that conceptual budget number, they did it using uh, real data. They did it using their, their cost history, their, their past projects, and they're not kind of just making up a number. They're, they're really pulling in from from their data sources and, and providing a, a solid number that can be trusted to the owner. Um, we find that a lot of companies these days, a lot of contractors are trying to uh, leverage their, their past project cost information for benchmarking and, and cost modeling perspective, but that effort seems to be uh, failing without a dedicated tool. So whether that's because the data is, is distributed on someone's laptop or on a server or uh, in a filing cabinet, worse yet, um, the, the data is not centrally accessible, it's not structured properly, and there's no tool to, to uh, properly exploit and utilize that data um, on future opportunities. So the, the 
the desire is there to do this work, but there's not really a good tool that's being used uh, to, to do this. Um, and then lastly, kind of our benchmarking use case, um, you know, the final GMP estimate that's communicated to an owner, um, you know, what kind of checks and balances are being put in place to make sure that that number is, is solid and, and things aren't being overlooked. Um, you can benchmark your uh, final detailed estimate against past projects of similar scope and uh, use that really as a, as a benchmarking tool as well for GMP estimates, not just conceptual estimates. So what can we kind of promise from a, you know, what will the product deliver to you as, a, as an end customer? I put on here 10x, but it, it's, it's a real number. So um, we've seen many customers uh, kind of revolutionize their conceptual estimating process with this tool. They're able to turn around, um, you know, 5, 10x uh, more conceptual bids using this tool, as well as increase the accuracy of those bids. So with this tool, you can kind of completely change uh, your process for, for producing conceptual budgets for the better um, by as much as 10x. So if we look at the solution uh, a little more specifically from a kind of features and, and benefits perspective, um, if I was to boil down kind of what it does to maybe six bullets here, so uh, you can centralize and secure all your, your past project cost history. So um, Model Logix allows you to, to import all of your, your cost histories, so whether that's via um, our Trimble tools like WinEst or Vico, or it's via other uh, detailed estimating applications, which I, I won't name today, but the idea is that you can uh, take all that data and via an Excel import, you can import all that data into Model Logix centralize it and expose it to all the end users that, that need to access it um, in a secure manner and completely indexed and structured in that database uh, and attributed so that it's usable, um, which is a, a nice lead into the, the next bullet, which is to search for estimates by their key cost driving attributes. So as data is imported into the model logic system, you're going to tag it or attribute it with all which we call smart categories with, with all of the key cost driving attributes that you want to store for all your data. Therefore, when you're looking for uh, on a future opportunity, you're looking through your past library of projects, you can search for uh, projects similar in scope based on those attributes that you tag with the data. So the data is structured, it's attributed, um, which allows you to kind of quickly and accurately create conceptual estimates or cost models um, right within the model logics application by taking that historical data and combining it with some of our analytical tools uh, and, and functions that are built into the software. From that, you can produce uh, reports and presentations that outline the actual details of that conceptual budget. So you can work um, either you know, via a report handout to the owner or kind of live in the software. You can work through that budget, show the comps uh, for the other projects that were used to produce that budget, and you can kind of show your, your targets and, and where they line up and stack up um, compared to the past projects across all systems. So um, you could look at any system and compare uh, where that current conceptual budget sits compared to, you know, five, ten other projects you've done in the past and, and help that owner understand um, where that cost is, is coming from, even though it's at a conceptual phase. And we're going to show some of those tools in the demonstration uh, shortly. Uh, you can use, and this was kind of a side use case that came out of the, out of the product, but it's actually used um, quite frequently. So the ability to benchmark your uh, GMP estimate or really any stage of the, of the detailed estimate against uh, your past projects. So we have the, the cost modeling um, use case and then we have the uh, benchmarking use case where you'd want to say, okay, I have my final detailed estimate that I've spent two weeks building and uh, well, let's actually go to a sanity check and compare it against five, ten other projects I've done in the same area that are similar in scope and see what I missed or if I missed anything or uh, really just kind of kind of sharpen that estimate a bit and, and make sure that you have everything covered. Um, and then lastly, you can analyze your data based on any work breakdown structure you choose. So if you want to use uh, CSI, you want to use Uniformat, you want to use your own uh, company's kind of customized work breakdown structure, those can be all imported to the system and, and you can slice and dice the data um, any way you'd like using any of those user-defined work breakdown structures. 
And on the right right hand side here is a is a graphic we like to call our closed loop integration graphic. These are all uh, products from the Trimble suite that uh, all integrate together and they they close the loop on the data. So if we start at the top with the model logics product, um, you're going to create feasibility or conceptual budgets in model logics. Um, those can feed your detailed estimates in in Winest or Vico cost planner. So your conceptual estimate can be used as the basis or starting point for your uh, detailed estimate, or it can be used as the target costs, uh, for example, uh, in, a, in a VICO cost plan. Um, going the other way, those estimates are fully integrated with, with the Model Logics product if they're coming out of VICO and West, in that they can automatically populate your Model Logics uh, library of projects, so that data flows seamlessly back to Model Logics as well. Um, again, moving uh, clockwise here, those detailed uh, budgets can feed your uh, project management suite in, in Prologue uh, as your starting budget in Prologue. And then those actuals can actually be fed back to Model Logics as well uh, to be used as actuals stored in your, in your Model Logics uh, project database. So you can store uh, both detailed estimates at all different stages in Model Logics as well as the actual costs in model logic for comparison. So some feedback here from a couple customers. Um, I won't read them kind of verbatim here, but uh, WebCore Builders is a, it's a happy customer of ours. And um, this is a nice thing that their uh, VP of construction had to say for us. Um, so the, the end use case is really creating realistic and early phase cost plants, um, mining all of your data. And uh, Ryan Companies is also a uh, happy customer of ours. So um, their director of pre-construction had a nice thing to say about our product as well here. We'll let you read through this um, quickly before I change the slide. And then I have a kind of more extensive customer list here as well um, of some of our reference customers who use the product. Um, and this is kind of some of the ENR, you know, top 100 general contractors. Maybe some of you see your name on this list. <laughs> um, but there's also um, a lot of kind of mid-market or even small market GCs that have taken advantage of model logics as well. So it's not just the big guys, it's, it's everyone seeing value out of it. So if we were thinking about this from a metric perspective, what kind of return on investment could you expect to see from model logics? Um, as we had stated in the mission statement, you can see a 10x reduction in the time it takes to create an accurate conceptual estimate. Um, you can see a 30% reduction in detailed estimate errors and oversight, and potentially a 5x increase in business opportunities where there's limited scope. So no longer will you be kind of um, lacking the capability to respond to those, those budgetary estimate requests. Um, you'll now be able to produce those confidently and open up uh, yourself to much more opportunity on the business side. And that's my last slide there, Mike. So if you want to um, pass it over to, to Gustav for the demo, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Th thanks a lot, Mike. Appreciate that, uh, that insight. Um, so, so now moving forward, uh, we'll go ahead and pass it over to our, uh, our uh, solutions expert, Gustavo, um, and, and he'll jump into model logics and start showing some of the solution. So what I'm going to show you today is kind of a typical workflow within Model Logics, just to kind of give you a feel for how, e how easy it is to use and, and leverage it in your business. Uh, before I do that, I wanted to give a quick background so you kind of get a feel for who I am and, and uh, why I'm doing what I'm doing. Uh, I'm a former WebCore guy, worked for WebCore for the last eight years, so I was actually a user of the product, uh, not only Model Logics, but Vico Office and Winest. I did project engineering first first two years of my stint and the last five in pre-construction and estimating. So something I'm passionate about. I also teach at the college level estimating and I actually use Trimble products as well. So what you're viewing on my screen now is our homepage for Model Logics. Uh, this, is, this is where you can either import your estimates via Winest or Excel, uh, create, create cost models or, or search estimates that you've if you've housed within Model Logics. First thing that I would do is go to search, 
And right now the program is querying the data, uh, bringing up all the projects that I have in my historical database. So currently I have projects all over the US. They're listed on a map, but they're also listed down below as a spreadsheet. I can get some data from, from the project just from looking at this sheet as well. I can see the industry segment, the size of the project, uh, any metrics that are, you know, that are very key, like G gross square footage or contact area of, of skin or ratio of shell to skin. So the first thing I would do is go into my estimate information or my smart, smart categories. So estimate information or metrics that you would that you input for each project as you're importing them, basically giving them the name, the date, the address, um, size, longitude, latitude, uh, so on and so forth. Another, another category, another section that we can use to, to sort our projects is smart categories. So the smart categories are basically things that you would set up sp specifically for your company. Say, for example, you would want to use industry segments. You wanted to be able to categorize your projects by either corporate, healthcare, retail, um, education, so on and so forth. So why don't we create a quick cost model? Uh, the first thing that the first thing I would do is probably narrow things down by size. So let's say, for example, we have a client that is looking for a hospital project. They've called us up. They want a courtesy estimate. Tip, the typical workflow for most companies is to start scrambling and looking for all their their past estimates, either looking in their you know their Excel you know Excel files or Timberline or looking on the server and trying to locate everything and and pick parts and pieces, or even just pulling from your own from your own mind. A lot of people kind of have numbers in their head. So what, what we attempt to do here is kind of put it all at your fingertips, ready to use, um, and be able to locate by just entering some few simple metrics. So in this particular case, I, uh, let's say, for example, our clients want a 120,000 square foot hospital. I've narrowed down my, I've narrowed down my size. I've got about six, six projects left. At this point, I still have probably too many projects and I have it narrowed by hospital. So now what I can do is actually isolate by healthcare, activate the, activate the actual uh, smart category by checking the box. It looks like I have two projects. Might be a little small for my sample size, so I may want to go a little bigger. Now I have three projects, which would be, which would be uh, a better sample set. I just want to confirm, uh, can everybody, is everybody viewing, able to view my screen? Mike, yep, may I see you. Okay, yep. okay, just making sure I got a message here, just, all right. So I, I've isolated three projects uh, that are within 92,000 square feet, 125. I've also isolated it based on industry segment, which is healthcare. At this point, I can actually create the cost model. I have some tools up here. I can either export this data as it sits now to Excel, uh, but in this case, I want to create a new model. I select a location, so we, we give you the option to create, you know, like a Windows type folder structure. I want to save it under models, and we'll just uh, use that name, which is fine. So right now, what it's doing is it's running the algorithms comparing the three different projects to create a, a cost model based on a lot of different metrics whether it's averages and kind of running the numbers between the, the square footages and trying to normalize the data. Once we get to the next screen we'll be able to enter our date and location for the project so it will normalize the data by location and by time. So our client has asked for a 120,000 square foot building. Uh, we could also use different metrics, say we could use beds, rooms, floors, whatever the metric may be, you can, you can adjust for it as well. And as long as your projects, as long as the projects that you've saved in your historical data have, have been categorized in that way, you could leverage that data as well. Uh, typically everybody does, usually does it by gross square foot. Now the next, the key metric we need to enter is the date that we're building the project. As things built 10 years ago aren't gonna cost the same as they do now or in the future. So let's say we're building it today. 
and we the next metric we need to normalize is this location. So let's say we want to build this build this hospital in, in San Francisco. The software is connected with a uh, with mapping soft with ma mapping integration, so it'll find the longitude and latitude. At a minimum, we need we need a city, but we could actually put an address if we want to. Uh, we can also add a picture in the, the the picture image of the project, which would which actually show up on your report. We, we won't add one today, just for for the sake of time. Now we have the ability to normalize the data, normalize the the cost model by a location. In this particular case, we're using RS means, but you could use ENR or you can also create your own. A lot of a lot of uh, companies have their own. You could use Turner's. Uh, cost index as well, or you know any of the other companies that are out there, Gilbane. So we pick San Francisco. So once these metrics have been selected, we can actually move into analyzing the data. So I just simply click into spreadsheet. Up here I have the row, my row of commands, and now it's lined up my projects side by side. I have my new cost model, which is my sample hospital. And I have my my three other projects that I'm actually basing my cost model off of. Up here, you have the ability to slice and dice the data as you like. For example, I can actually look at it from a higher level and say, all I care about is divisions, and I want to review it as a division. I can also add more metrics. So if I wanted to isolate labor, I can then I can find out okay how much did I spend on general conditions in labor or material and I can also get rid of those and maybe I want to look at it from a systems format a unit format level and maybe get rid of divisions so as you can see it's it's really quick and easy to flip back and forth between different views different coding structures and the key, again, is making sure that as you bring the data in, that it's cross-coded with the codes that you want to be able to slice the data with. And you could even combine and mix mix and match uh, master format with unit format and put one in front of the other or any way, any way you'd like to see it. So now what we can do is we've analyzed it. We can see it from a uh, from a numbers perspective but really where the where a lot of the power lies in being able to transmit this data to others is being able to show it graphically and this is where say somebody who is not an estimator or somebody is not really comfortable looking at all these numbers but really understands kind of under understand estimating or the the, the cost of a job based on kind of higher metrics we can jump into a, a graph view so with the graph view here that you're that you're viewing, we have the dollar amounts over here on the right, and we have the scopes of work or the work breakdown structures to the bottom. And what you're viewing here, for example, in general conditions, we have three nodes. Each of these nodes represents our sample our our sample projects, and then we have our cost model is the node with the, with the pointy pointy end. And basically, what this is telling us is along divisions one, two, and three, our risk probably isn't so great because we actually have a pretty tight amount of, we, our, our costs are pretty tight, tightly bundled together. Where we are running into a little more risk is in their finishes and woods and plastics. And you can see this by the wide range. So we have a project that's down in 11 million and we have a, a project up here in 14 million. So what this can prompt uh, our pre-con managers and estimators to do is analyze these projects a little deeper, understand what's driving these costs. And we can even jump in a little deeper to, to kind of see what, what, it is, what is it about the project that's really driving the cost here. And we can see rough carpentry here is another pretty wide range. Um, elevators as well is another wide range. And we can also do the same slicing and dicing of the data as we did in the spreadsheet view. So now we're looking at it in uniformat, and we can see that the shell and the services are our top dollar, our 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 driving forces in our in our money, and also see that the risk is higher there. 
And just as we saw in the spreadsheet, we can actually slice it and dice it. We can isolate labor and understand that a lot of our labor money is coming from interiors. That's what's driving the cost. Uh, we can also see our subcontractor, so our services typically, you know, a lot of the money is going to our MEP there and our shell. So once we've once we're analy we've analyzed the data, we're comfortable with the cost model, we want to move forward and we want to actually publish this to our constituents, whether it is our client, our executives, our uh, estimating team, we can move into reports. So I've, I've set up a, a demo report here. And this is the final product that you'd receive. So this is where you'd have your picture of your project, uh, maybe a rendering or you know the, the napkin sketch you may have received. Our second page is our table of contents. So you can navigate through the, the report. We have our spreadsheet view that we looked at previously. Um, we can create different views depending on how we slice the data. In this particular case, I included only two. We can look at some uh, key metrics, um, GSF, number of floors, number of beds, exterior material, building footprint, ratio of shell surface area to building footprint. Does it include a parking structure? And now we can move into looking at the other projects that made up the model and also their key metrics as well. And at the very end, you could include either one of the graphics or several of them kind of showing graphically you know what where you landed on the project what are the what are the driving factors and the costs and again we see that the interiors and the exterior are the driving factors uh, another really uh, great feature and something that gives you dividends down the line as you move on to other projects and maybe somebody else pick, is picking up the pieces to create to recreate more models you can actually associate files. You can associate files um, to each model. You can save, say, drawings, specs, schedules, anything that you can save in, in a Windows per, uh, Explorer. You can drag into here, um, including an, an estimate file if you were to move it to that to that place. Um, you can also take notes about the project. We can look at some more statistics. Uh, look at the mean, median, and minimum of each project, um, and slice the, slice the data the same way we can with the other the other views, as with range and spreadsheet. And uh, and one other feature that I can show you here, um, if for whatever reason there's a there's a number that you're not comfortable with in your cost model, and you know for a fact that you know general conditions is not twenty five dollars twenty eight. 75 you can update the numbers and as you add more rows say we want to add major we can see all the numbers that have been affected by that wholesale change of 35 will hope will show up in red but I can easily just revert back to the original numbers as well so it looks like um, we have a couple questions let me uh, mm -hmm. Open up our questions. Yes. So there's there's one question from uh, from Shabas Gustavo. Maybe you can touch on that. I think is pretty important, and and that is is Model Logics able to work with other estimating programs like Sage and CMIC? Absolutely, absolutely. There is not a direct integration, but through an ex uh, through an export, um, Sage CMIC can export very easily to a CSV file or an Excel file. And as long as you've basically, you know, had your have your coding structure down, and you have your columns and your rows in the right places, um, it's a quick import. And then there's also a direct import from WinS as well, if you're not using, if you're using something else. Okay, great. I think we have. A... You know, I can I can add a little bit to that too, um, just from a what are our current customers doing? So, um, I guess as much as as much as we'd like to think that everybody uses all of our products for all facets, uh, I, I would say a, a good portion of them do use uh, either Excel for estimating or, or Sage or, or MC squared products um, for estimating. And no problem working with Modelogix and, and getting those imports. And 
Um, and, and as far as the, the project management and, the, and accounting side, uh, you know, that there's no problem with people not using Prolog for budget management. You could use CMIC or whatever your, your tool is, and that's very common today. Hey, Mike, uh, Mike Malone. Um, is there anything uh, that I might have missed here on the demo that you'd like me to kind of review a little deeper? I think you did a, I think you did a really good job, and I think you, you did kind of the, the end user's use case. Um, you know, there's a, whole, there's a whole setup aspect to it that I think would probably be more appropriate for one-on-one -on -one demonstrations. So um, that's, that's how you kind of, we could show you how to get from a, an empty database, so to speak, to, to something set up like what we're showing in the demo today. Um, and we have, we have services teams and everything that, to help with that, but it's pretty straightforward in the application. So um, if you want to just click on set up there, just so I can reference some of the areas. Okay. Um, so things like setting up your cost indices, um, you know, adding markups, uh, setting up the metrics you want to track in the system, um, setting up all your integration points through, through options, um, setting up your smart categories, which is probably the single most important thing in the product. So this is really a, um, a whiteboarding exercise at first. So you're going to want to sit down with your team and, and understand how do you want to attribute all of your, your project information related to cost um, to make it more searchable down the road. Um, so the way we set up smart categories is it's, we call it kind of a parent-child hierarchy. So you can have different questions um, for different areas. So for example here, industry segments, you know, is a multiple choice question. And for healthcare, for example, has specific questions that corporate office and retail don't. And it's very flexible in that way. And you can make them multiple choice, numeric, yes, no, text entries, um, really anything you'd want to possibly uh, attribute your data with. Um, so smart category is super important. Um, and, you know, we have we have consultants and, and services teams that can help you um, kind of get the, get your thoughts going on that as well. And then you can set up custom units in the system. So out of the box, it comes with, um, I don't know, a bunch, <laughs> more than you'll probably ever need. But there's there's always a few that you you may not have in here. Like I don't think gross square feet comes out of the box. Maybe we added it recently. And what you can do is add your unit of measure, and you can add all your abbreviations to it that you use. Um, so when it's importing that data, it recognizes that as the unit of measure. So you can see your foot is, is FT. Uh, there's a user management aspect here. So if an administrator goes in, um, they can create new users in the system, assign them a role, and they're off and running. And then last uh, is the work breakdown structure tables. So um, this is where I had said that you could, you could really choose any kind of uh, coding structure you would like. Um, we use in our demo like master format, unit format um, to, to show examples of more industry standards, but you can really set those up however you track costs. Um, and the way that works is you'd set up kind of a, a bucket. So in this case, division would be a table. And then all of the codes and names are, are imported from the data that comes in. So that is all automatically done. You don't have to re-enter all that data. So that's a very quick rundown of, of the administrative aspect of it. Um, but it, it is important as well, and it, it's how you get from point A, which is a, an empty database, to, to point B, which is, uh, you know, a fully set up system with a bunch of data imported. And, you know, something else that would be good for a follow-up demo down the road would be we can, we can demonstrate how data is imported and how that process works. Um, you know, probably a bit much for a kind of general webinar like this, but there's a, there's a importing from WinEst and, and Vico aspect that's very automated. And then there's an Excel aspect as well, which is also pretty easy to do. You just set up um, a te one-time template, and you, you basically um, link all of your rows and columns to the correct data and systems and, and import it that way. So that's, that's the administrator's view of the system. Um, you know, we, we designed this software to be very easy to use. So our, our intention is always... Uh, to make it as easy for the end user to produce budgets and search through projects as, as possible, as well as the administrator uh, setting up the system, make it as easy on them as possible. So that, that's, I guess, the other kind of half of the demo there that, that if we had more time, we could spend a lot of time on. Great, Mike. Yeah, in, in regards to the, the administrator uh, 
stuff. I have a question from Nathan here um, who asks, how, how many projects do you realistically need in your database to establish model objects as a, as a pretty useful tool? Is there, there a number you, you would recommend or that you've seen in the industry? That's a really good question. Um, and so I think, as we showed here in the demo, you, you can create a cost model with two, three projects, for example. Um, what you'd want to do is, is get a good spread across, like if we think about industry segments, for example, at least get, you know, five, ten healthcare projects in, for example, so that you can start creating budgets for, you know, for hospitals and, and, and clinics. Uh, so focus maybe on, on one specific segment or one area that you want to start building uh, models for, whether that, that's the data that is the most well-structured in your, in your historicals or it's the, the budgets that you're building the most, um, you know, it's the project types that you're building the most budgets for. I'd say start with one area, focus on that, get five or ten of those in the system, and you can kind of be off and running um, from there. So we've had customers get running with as little as ten projects in there. And really, the, the data scrubbing exercise is, is the part that is the hump to get over. So it, it's all just going to depend on, on how your data is structured and, and how much um, scrubbing needs to happen to that data before it's, it's clean enough to import in the system and use for modeling. Um, and so, you know, start with your cleanest data first, get three, five, ten projects in there. Um, and, and the other thing I'd say to that is a lot of companies have used model logics as a catalyst. To, to get uh, clean data coming out of their estimators and out of, out of their project managers. So um, they say what they like to do is get a few projects in the system, uh, show kind of the end game to their, their estimators and say, guys, look, if we could get um, data in the system clean like this, um, man, look what we could do with it. And that really gets people going on, on uh, producing clean data and cleaning up estimates so that it's um, you know, even more usable in the system. So, twofold there. Great, thanks. So, out of curiosity, uh, yeah, there's there's one other question here, more of a licensing question that I'd like to pose to Mike um, from from uh, from a Chow. He's and I know they're they're currently Model Logics users, so he he asked. I understand there would be a web-based Model Logic Model Logics release soon. Could you give me a timeline when this? new version of model logics will be released and how the transition will, will, will happen. Sure, I can, I can answer that um, as best I can on, on this call. I, I will say that um, I, I'd, like to, I, I'd like to follow up there individually with some specifics on that, but, um, so which I'd be totally happy to do after this call. Um, from a general perspective, uh, yes, we, we are releasing a, a web-based uh, model logics, and it's slated for, I'll say, uh, mid to later this summer is, is when we're targeting a release of it. And from a transition perspective, um, existing customers, we will um, be offering you know, a, a promotion and things like that around uh, migrating uh, over to the, the cloud-based version. So. Um, I'll work with you on specifics on that after. Um, I will put, um, I don't know what the best mechanism to do this, but if someone could provide my email address um, to the crowd here, we could, um, whoever asked that question could certainly reach out to me after this call and we can set up a quick uh, discussion on that. Sure, yeah. And I, I it's just, it's just Mike underscore Malone at Trimble.com. I think we have a, oh, maybe that was the question that was asked, okay. So uh, here's a question from, uh, from Anthony and Gustavo. Uh, what is the best way to connect mul multiple offices to one database? Maybe Mike, Mike, you want to connect on that? I think you, that's more of a technical back-end question. Yeah. Hello, Mike. Melo? Did we lose Mike? Oh, sorry. Mike, I think, you, I think you might have been muted. I got muted. All right, can you guys hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Sorry. Did you hear the question I, I was proposed? I was chatting right there. No one can. So, um, 
so there's there's a bunch of ways to do that today in the product. That the best way to do it is going to be when we get that, that cloud version released, and it's going to be dead simple because all you'll need is an internet connection and and uh, you know the proper credentials to get in and and anybody will access it. From a multi-office deployment perspective, um, you know you could either set it up on on your WAN or, or on a centrally accessible server, um, or a lot of our customers use Citrix for deployment, um, so they'll they'll host it on Citrix and, and deploy the application and, and all the services that way. Um, that said, you know, one of the main, so, so it's totally possible today with the self-host version, I just named, you know, three different ways you could do that. Um, and a bunch of our customers, uh, especially our, our larger GCs that have do multi-office deployments, five, 10 different deployments, do that today um, via Citrix or, or via a centrally accessible server. Um, one of the main reasons, though, for uh, for that future version that we're going to put out there is uh, is to ease that process as, as best possible and and put it out on, on the cloud so that um, anybody in the organization can access it, you know, from any internet connection and, and any proper credentials that they have. So um, that's what we're uh, planning on releasing, but totally possible today as well. Great, thanks, Mike. All right, I, I don't see any other questions as of right now, Gustavo. Um, Mike, uh, lo looks like we got through the demo pretty quickly. Um, is there any other components you guys wanted to touch on in the last 15 minutes here? Well, I just wanted to make sure um, that we, we I, uh, uploaded some handouts um, for the attendees um, if they wanted like something to kind of look at later. Uh, put up a Model Logics brochure. A model logic data sheet and a web core case study if they wanted to kind of get a little more information that maybe we didn't cover today and um, we can definitely answer more questions later on as well past this webinar great yeah, you, YouTube's a great resource too YouTube's a great resource for for videos too so um, if you want to learn a little bit more about the product or share it out um, share out a demo with other colleagues uh, that's totally available there and uh, we would be more than happy as well to do a kind of advanced demonstration for anybody who wants to get a hands-on uh, one-on-one -on -one demonstration uh, after this call. Thanks Mike and um, just so all the attendees are, are aware I, I'm gonna post both my uh, my personal email and as well as Gustavo's email in, in the chat so if you guys have any follow-up questions um, or need additional information in the future, um, you can get it on there. You can send it to us and, uh, and, and we'd be happy to answer all of your questions. Great. Well, I appreciate your time, Mike and Gustavo. Uh, looks like we wrapped up a little bit early so all the attendees can get back to their Fridays. Uh, Thanks for your time this afternoon, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you in the future. Have a great day and a great weekend, everybody. Take care, guys. Thanks.